Authentic Experts with Kara James, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they have learned on their road to success and get exclusive advice on how to implement their success into your life and business. Authentic Experts with Kara James is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Kara. Hello, everybody. Kara James here from Authentic Experts, and I'm really excited to introduce you to my guest today, Amy Schoenthal. Uh, Amy is a journalist, author, and marketing executive who's worked in social media marketing since that was even a thing. <laughs> uh, for some of the world's largest brands from Procter & Gamble to Google, her nearly two-decade agency career has included public relations, event planning, influencer marketing, content creation, and strategy. Blending her marketing expertise, journalism training, and, and storytelling prowess, she works with founders and leaders to shape the narrative of their journeys. Amy approaches storytelling as sense-making. As a top contributor to Forbes Women, she shines the spotlight on those who have been historically underestimated, yet are doing the work to solve society's biggest problems. Amy's interviewed hundreds of leaders from Senator Maisie Hirono, Norma Kamali, Tori Birch, Marie Kondo, Robin Arzon, Eve Radsky, Jennifer Seibel Newsom, and more. Amy's spoken at conferences such as Social Media Week, the Start to Finish Flourish Summit, NFT Week, the Mom 2 Summary, Luminaries How We Build It, and more. She wrote a local children's book about the independent-owned businesses in her own beloved neighborhoods of Sunnyside, Queens, where she lives with her husband and four-year-old daughter. Her book about how leaders triumph over setbacks is coming out in 2024. Amy, <laughs> welcome. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You went with the long bio. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, that it's great because now we know, you know, we, we can we can feel you. We know you. So, <laughs> boy, you've got a lot going on. So let's let's dive in. Uh, and I don't even know where to start. <laughs> a lot of times I start with just the kids because I'm like, oh, dude, want to get a little bit of a personal background. But um but yeah, so so you're in. We'll get we'll delve into the business aspect in a moment. But yeah, you're in Queens with your husband and a four year old. And tell us about tell us about your what's a day in the life look like for you, Amy? As far as right having a a young child and then just with everything that you have going on here. Um, you know, yeah. That. Well, I think like most mothers, I am meticulous and rigorous about how I spend my time mm. and. That precious time in between, you know, preschool and when your child care, preschool drop off and when your child care ends is like, I'm going to jam as much in there as possible. Um, and so my day begins when we obviously wake up, have like a little bit of a, you know, tug of war, getting ready, getting out <laughs> the door, that whole thing. I get my daughter to preschool at 820. And from there, I don't really start my agency marketing job until about 930. So I have this glorious hour plus, and I am very, very thoughtful about what I do with that time on any given day. And that's how I'm able to write a book, uh, freelance, write for Forbes women, uh, profile some really amazing people, um, because I kind of reserve that hour plus every morning for writing and for, you know, my own stuff that, that brings me joy, that keeps me happy, that keeps me sane before diving into, you know, the chaos of working at a marketing firm, yeah. which is also very demanding. Um, and so, yeah. And then I, I go into my day. It's a lot of Zoom meetings. It's a lot of, you know, decorating, planning, strategy, uh, client work, things like that. Um, and then I, you try to wind down, uh, around five 30, if I can, that's not always an option, but I try if I can, and I'll try to listen to like a podcast for 20 minutes or do something that doesn't require a lot of brain power or energy because it's a nice, it's sort of like replaces the commute. It, it helps me wind down my day and transition from work to family. And then, um, yeah, around six, six 30, I go and I have, dinner, see my kids, see my husband, have family time. If it's nice out, we'll take a walk around our neighborhood. And that's that. And after kid yeah. bedtime, it's like basically my bedtime. Like maybe we'll yeah. maybe <laughs> I'll do a little reading. Maybe I'll like 
squeeze in a show, but you know, she's yeah. in bed at eight o'clock and I'm in bed, but yeah. like not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I understand that. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing. Yeah, and, and look at how much you can get done as far as your writing, right? In an hour. Isn't that crazy when we can, I mean, you've got to be really disciplined to do that, but that's really impressive that. That you can do that as much as you do everything that you have. It's really remarkable how much you can fit into small chunks of your day if you really carve it out yeah, and you carve don't it out. Let other things seep in. Like I could be sitting there filling out camp forms or, you yeah. know, checking my inbox or doing all the sort of inbound things that I have to do. Um, but I try to reserve those kinds of tasks for breaks in the day or, um, you know, my, my brain first thing in the morning is, is good. <laughs> I want to use that good like <laughs> yeah, energy yeah. to get something done that I'm excited to get done. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Cool. I know. I find that that's my best time of day as well, but I, I've said, I want to be doing everything then, you know what I, I like? Yeah. I want to be at the gym then I want to be yeah. writing then I want to be doing my content. I want to be, you know, I want to be relaxing. I was like, I can't do everything from five to eight a.m. that I want to do. One day a week, right? Yeah. Like Monday's yeah. gym. Tuesday, yeah, Monday's yeah. Monday's content. Yeah. You know, that's kind of yeah. how I do it. Like this yeah. day, I'm going to write a Forbes article. This day, I'm going to work on my own manuscript, and then yeah, this day I'm going to exercise. I don't even write every day. Like I have to take breaks. So yeah, yeah, sure. So I know in Forbes magazine, that's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about that. What are you know, just give some examples of your favorite articles or you know things that you. Sure. Again, I'm, I'm, <laughs> am I am I putting you on the spot? I didn't no, know. No, that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> I've been writing for Forbes since I think like 2016. Mm. And so I'm I'm an OG. I I started out writing about marketing, um, like giving marketing tips. And then I started interviewing people and talking about how they were marketing their businesses. And that sort of transitioned slowly into me just doing larger profile stories about founders and entrepreneurs and leaders Mm. about their journey and what got them to where they are, because that's really what readers are interested in. Like, how did you build this cool thing um, how did you do it? How did you make it successful? And what were the obstacles that you faced on the way? Because no one, you know, we could all talk about the the sweet stuff and the success, but the real meat of everyone's story is what they had to overcome to get there. And especially um, in terms of marginalized groups, uh, women, minorities, um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, there were extra obstacles for those folks to build businesses and get funding and be taken seriously and build credibility. And so frankly, their stories are the most interesting and most inspiring because they had to sort of, you know, climb the mountain from, from the base. They weren't helicoptered there. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're right. Well, I'm glad that you're really shining a light on that. And, and it's, it's true. I think, you know, we, I don't know, we tend to overlook that right or we have different obstacles everybody's got their own obstacles and uh yeah. there's there's different variations to it but yeah it, it, we all need to share what we've gone through and it, even if it just helps <laughs> a couple of people right whatever it may be and you know we started up and what you know in our day-to-day uh life it's not all shiny yeah most of it's not is right <laughs> But the times that it is good, it's it's good. So yeah. 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 So and why did you choose to focus on the way founders and leaders work through setbacks is is your beat for the past few years? Yeah. It's it's the core part of their story, usually. And that's why I'm writing a book about that. Because every founder and leader, again, like I started writing about marketing and how did you use marketing to get to where you are? And then it just as, as I went and as I wrote more and more, I started to get deeper into their just overall origin stories and their journeys. Mm-hmm. And the pinnacle of everyone's story is always when they encountered a setback and how they got through it. For for many people, it's the setback that sparked the idea to build whatever business they built. And in the case of most of the people I talk to, those businesses aren't just bringing them money or success or you know, solving some sort of gap in the marketplace, they're really solving a lot of society's bigger issues because Mm. that's what happens after a setback. You see the problem and you are just so motivated to solve it. And that's, again, people are attracted to those types of businesses because it helps them, but there's always like a bigger purpose 
to a lot of them. And these are still businesses that make a lot of money. They're not nonprofits. They're not philanthropies. Mm-hmm. It's just businesses that exist to make money, solve a problem, and um, you know, address these larger issues. Yeah, great. I know. So yes, the setback cycle is what you're talking about, your book that's coming out in 2024. Excited about that. So how many people have you, what, give us a little bit of, if you can, of what yeah. you can expect from in the book. And, uh, sure. I, well, it's really, uh, it, it's really born of, of my articles and the stories that I've been telling over the past few years. And really just from what we were talking about, how the setback is the pinnacle of their story. And I, I just kept seeing this trend, like why is, and I was like, why is this happening? And this isn't like the ooze, like Silicon Valley, like fail big and make mistakes. And no, we're not like a privileged few going out to like try to make mistakes. That's not, we're not glorifying failure, glorifying yeah. pain. Anyway. It's just that inevitably most people will, will experience some type of setback. And I just, I couldn't stop seeing this, this little trend, this big trend that people would come up with their best ideas after working through a setback. And so I started to dig into that and I started to talk to psychologists and executive coaches and people who, you know, again, really dug deep into founder stories and journeys and counseled them through what they were going through. And I started to ask, like, why does this happen? And I read all the, you know, the business leadership books and the, like, the self-help books and all, like, everyone touches on this, but no one has really explored it in depth. So that's what I did. And I talked to um, quite a host of experts, not just the founders and the leaders whose stories I share as examples of this, but one of the experts is actually a neuroscientist who has proven in her lab that setbacks are more apt to rewire your brain than successes. And that's what actually, it's like human evolution. Your brain is changing every day, all the time, just in this, you know, 20 minute conversation, our brains are changing because we're learning, but you learn more from setbacks because it's a moment when, you have to rethink what's been happening, right? A setback is defined as a reversal in progress. So if you have been building a business, like I I talk about one, uh, she's a, Pollock Patel, and she's a celebrity chef who, you know, she was on Beat Bobby Flay and Chopped, and she was about to open an upscale restaurant in New York City's Hudson Yards. And that is just like, most chefs just dream of that moment opening their own restaurant upscale in a very sexy neighborhood in New York city. She was so excited. And that was in March, 2020. So one by one, as she was picking out like appliances, like they were getting ready to go. She was picking out appliances. One Mm -hmm. investor called, Hey, I don't think I can do this anymore. Obviously then the, you know, the world shut down. She hopped on a plane and she went to her parents in Atlanta for what she thought would be a two week trip. And we all know what happened to the restaurant industry yeah. there. So that's like an example of a major setback. Mm-hmm. And she just had, you know, she had been working towards this thing, this dream. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like ripped away from her. Like it was for you know, many yeah. people at, at that time. And What's interesting, though, is that once she sort of processed the experience, she was in Atlanta for much longer than she thought she would be. She was with her family for much longer than she had ever spent with them in the past, you know, decade. And all of a sudden she realized, you know, maybe Atlanta was where she belonged. And then she went to one day she just went to check out a new food hall that had opened up in some hip uh, Atlanta neighborhood. And there was an empty food stall. Oh my God. On the spot, she signed a lease for the food stall and started cooking, you know, casual North Indian street food for people in Atlanta. And it was so successful. Like it wasn't a sexy, you know, Hudson Yards, fancy upscale restaurant, but it felt more authentic to like who she was. was Now she's actually looking for a larger space because it's been so successful. And she wrote a cookbook while she was there. She was like, I have like, yeah. more in Atlanta in three years than I did in New York, you know, for over a decade. So it's, it's interesting how, and again, like, this is not what she wanted. This is not the path she was working towards, but mm-hmm. 
Once no, she started no. muted yeah. and accepted what had happened to her, mm-hmm. she found a way, a way through. Mm-hmm. I love that. First, there's a few things going through my head right now. We talked yesterday about, you know, just in what my my podcast brings to the table and that type of thing. And and I just said that I'm always, every episode, I seem to get a chill. So that was my chill moment for sure. What a great story. Mm-hmm. There's so many of these stories. Yeah. There are so many of these stories. And, you know, some of that, and so some of the ones I include in the book are from well-known people like Norma Kamali, you mentioned, Robin Arzon. Uh, those are the well-known people. So you might know a little bit about their story. I go in, into a little more detail because of the interviews I did with them. But there's also people like Pollock and um, Nicole Stipp in Louisville who uh, decided to bring the whiskey whiskey to a community in Louisville who was previously excluded from it, like women and uh, BIPOC community and LGBTQ plus folks who were previously excluded from the Kentucky whiskey scene. And so there's people doing this like all over the place. They're like solving problems. They're creating community. They're creating spaces. They're creating successful businesses. But they're also, again, like addressing some of these bigger issues that need to be addressed. Oh, wonderful. Just a feel good all the way around. Yeah. I can't wait to read your book. So, you. Yeah. And, and I'm glad, yeah, from coming into our community and uh, everybody can get to know and, you know, put your background and when your book comes out, you'll have a lot of support, I'm sure. So I'm excited. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I'm so glad that we, that we met today. And, um, yeah, just... <laughs> What you know, I'm always saying to my kids, everything happens for a reason. My son was just flying out Saturday, and there's eight of them going on a, um, uh, <laughs> well, it sounds like the movie The Hangover. Um, they're going to Vegas for a senior trip for college. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but they all got split up, and one's flying here, the other one had to go here. The flight got canceled. I know this is just this is nothing compared to your story, but just the same thing. You know, like you know what. Everything happens for a reason. You don't know what would have happened if you all went on that flight. Or I'm just, I feel like I'm constantly saying that. And, and even with things in my own life and just obstacles or a failed launch or something, you know, like, well, you know what? That's okay because <laughs> I pivoted and went this way and it worked out a lot better. So, yeah. Um, I mean, all have to try to look on the bright side. Yeah. Some things just stink, right? Some things just stink and there's no like big yeah. epiphany after it. Yeah. You just but- Setbacks can be productive. Setbacks can lead to greater things. Well, you know, there's, I I want to acknowledge that some things just stink and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Not every like failure or hiccup has to like birth something, you know, incredible or creative, but it it can happen, especially, um, you know, when it comes to businesses and, and things like that. Yeah, for sure. And, but like you said, don't be the woe is me. We don't need yes. to go and crawl up and, you know, crawl in a corner, figure out what's next. Yeah. I mean, crawl in a corner if you have to. Crawl in a corner, take what time you need, process the experience, but don't ruminate, right? Reflect, but don't ruminate. That, oh, that's great. Yeah. Ruminating is, yeah. I think that's what I, I know people that, you know, and it's, it's sad. I really think it can not ruin your life, but ruminating can really be so damaging. You know, I've had friends where you're like, you're still thinking about that. That was, you know, it was so minor and, oh, it's terrible. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes we can't help it. But I do have exercises in the book that help you get. Oh, through. nice. Even if you're obsessing over something and you kind of can't get out of your own way. Um, I mean, I think also that's like a time to reach out to a coach, reach out to a friend. Like there's people yeah. in your life that can probably help you through that. And there's probably a very good reason why you're ruminating, but there's also exercises to sort of help. Oh, you nice. That's great. Ask the right questions. Yeah. The, uh, the executive coaches and the psychologists I t- and the neuroscientists that I spoke to um, helped me sort of like create these actionable, little actionable guides within the book. So it wasn't just like, here's what happened. It's like, here's what happened to this person. Here's the research that supports why this happened and the process that they went through. And here's something you can do if you find yourself in that moment. Yeah. Oh, great. Gosh, I'm really excited. Really excited for your book. (laughs) And speaking of books, the last question I ask is what, what book do you recommend to the audience? Do you have a favorite or something that you have loved or learned from and 
Want to share? I have so many. <laughs> oh, sorry, question. Because I, okay, because I referenced her, I'm going to recommend Chantel Pratt's The Neuroscience of You. It sounds really heady and like a textbook. It's actually very funny. She oh. explains neuroscience on a level that we can all understand. And she explains why, you know, your brain might be different than mine. Your brain processes experience differently than mine. And it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating. It's not necessarily like a quick beach read, but it's not as heady as like a, a neuroscience test. Because it sounds, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, it's a lovely in between and it helps you understand a little bit about, you know, why human beings are the way they are, how our brains work and how we process how we adapt, how we, uh, you know, process information and, and how we grow, grow, basically how we get better at stuff. So it's a great book. Wonderful. Oh my gosh. I'm going to be ordering that as soon as I, <laughs> I do that. I'll go right over to Amazon and yep. You know, another thing I love Amazon will be on the front step tomorrow. So yay. Thank you for that recommendation. And thank you for being here, Amy. It was thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Come back anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Authentic Experts with Kara James. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we'll see you on the next episode.